Okay. Um, welcome to PSM Maths Festival. We're thrilled to have you join us. We believe that maths should be an engaging and accessible to everyone. Our aim over the course of the festival is to come together as the maths teaching community to share amazing ideas and stories of how to engage and inspire our learners, especially in how we can amplify the teaching and learning experience and empower all those involved in the maths education, from teachers to learners to families and communities. That's why our free conference is focused on driving conversation, from reflecting on the recent changes in education and sharing practice to what the future of maths education could look like. Together with you, fellow educators and industry experts, our conversation will drive how we can help schools, colleges, learners and families make the most of maths education now and in the future. To ensure as many people as possible can benefit from our discussion, we'll be recording this session and others throughout the week. However, we hope that you can join as many of the sessions as possible live to benefit from and contribute to the live discussions and to pose your questions. During this session, all participants can send in questions via the question and answer box. If you're not able to answer, if we're not able to answer your questions in the session, we'll follow up after the event. Please also use the chat function to talk to uh, each other throughout the session. You can be part of the conversation on social media too using the hashtag PSNMathFest21 and by entering our mini competition competition, sorry, nominating your colleagues as math champions and by answering our polls that you'll see on at Pearson Schools. Do please get involved in this. Now for this session, uh, we're looking at how COVID-19 has affected schools and how swiftly they moved to online and remote learning to ensure sustainable, high quality and flexible teaching and learning. We, would, uh, we have a panel today consisting of leading experts who are, are at the forefront of digital mass education, and we will discuss the impact COVID-19 had over the last year, both in mass education as well as on their own platforms. We will explore the current state of remote learning from both educational and technology infrastructure perspectives, the current technology needs for the educators, the latest features on their own platforms, how the systems can support assessment for learning, and what does it mean for mass education going forward. My name is Melios Michael, and I am one of the PSM Credible Specialists. I am a curriculum leader of mathematics and an SLE at Hampstead Hall Academy in a comprehensive school in Birmingham. I have taken part in case studies on how to use technology in the classroom, um, worked with Cassia to assess the effectiveness of the graphic calculator in the classroom, and I have also tested quite a few of the online platforms uh, and seen the effectiveness within maths. Uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, I collaborated with the EdTech Demonstrated Program, and I've set up the digital provision plan for my academy trust uh, to support the blended and remote learning um, for the schools. Uh, with us today, we have um, some other specialists as well, which I'll, I'll pass on to introduce. So I'll start with um, Jamie from Dr. Frost. Uh, Jamie, please unmute yourself. Uh, sorry. <laughs> You mean right, I keep on doing that. <laughs> um, yeah, my name is Jamie Frost um, and I run Dr. Frost Maths, which is now um, a charity uh, aiming to give uh, free online maths education to students. Um, I've been running about seven years uh, initially sort of downloadable resources, but I now have a, an online platform uh, tool for teachers as well as a kind of platform for students to pr uh, practice questions with. And I've been a teacher for about nine years. Thank you very much, Jamie. I'll pass on to Shira from uh, Desmos. Hi, everyone. I'm so grateful to be coming to you from across the pond. Uh, I am currently stationed out of Brooklyn, New York, uh, but I taught math for nine years out in the Bay Area. I currently am a curriculum developer for Desmos, um, which many folks know as a free online graphing calculator, though we also have Desmos Classroom, which has free activities and an activity building platform. Thank you, Shira. Uh, and also we have J uh, Berwin Jones from Pearson as well. Yeah, hello everybody, I'm Berwin. Uh, so I head up the secondary maths and science teaching and learning uh, team at Pearson. Um, so I work on lots of different things. So Active Learn is one of our big products we work on. Um, I also worked on the national tutoring program uh, last year. Uh, and yeah, we're currently working on Active Hub, which is our kind of evolution of Active Learn. So we'll talk a bit about that later, I'm sure. Of course, thank you all of you for, for, for attending and today and being part of the panel. Um, with us, we also have Leona from Pearson as well, she, who's working at the uh, background and answering any of your Q&A as well. And if, if, if you have any questions to post them there. Leona, I don't know if you want to say hi. Hello, I'm Leona. Uh, I'm the product manager at Pearson and um, 
like Melia said, I'm working in the background. So any Q&A, please do fire those at me. And uh, I hope you enjoy the session today. Thank you, Liana. Um, so COVID-19 has taken schools by surprise. Uh, some were more prepared than others, and some schools did not use any cloud-based systems at all uh, before, before all this happened. Some did not even use mathematical digital packages for homework and had to set everything up um, during this during this pandemic. Some were proactive um, and they offered training to staff and students remotely. No, but uh, asking Jamie now, do you think schools have now got the right technology and infrastructure to support remote learning moving forward? Well, I, I think having spoken to lots of students and teachers at, at many schools, that there was quite a large diversity of experience, um, dependent on the amount of physical technology that students had, uh, but also the extent of kind of um, technolog technological kind of subscriptions and services that schools had. So at my school, for example, we uh, all our students have Chromebooks with inbuilt microphones, cameras, touch screens, and they've had those for a few years now um, before the pandemic started. Uh, and we use a lot of Google technology. Um, so a lot of classroom, uh, classwork and homework is set on Google Classroom. Uh, and during the lockdown, we, we try to teach live lessons as much as possible via Google Meet. So all the accounts are already set up, et cetera. Um, and, and what surprised me actually is just how much of the teaching experience we can sort of emulate using technology. Um, so certain things which are not ideal, obviously you still don't have that kind of physical interaction with students, but there's many things we can recreate um, like simple things like, I don't know, like the sort of virtual hands up, which most of the sort of uh, like things like Teams and, 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 yeah. and Meet has. Um, and um, like virtual whiteboards becoming increasingly popular, um, like the ability to sort of share slides. So you try, it, it, I would usually use slides and lessons anyway and sort of use a whiteboard, but now I have slides and just annotate over them, uh, directly over them. Uh, and also just many subject specific platforms. So. Um, there's lots of things in, for example, MFL and in mathematics in my school, we use, use Dr. Cross Maths, for example. Um, yeah. So I'm, I'm just impressed now how much technology can be used to sort of give a, a kind of best possible teaching experience without the actual real face to face interaction. Uh, and I think um, where students have been really disadvantaged is where schools haven't had that kind of um, technology provision. And I still think many schools need to catch up because in some schools they didn't have live meets, so we just sent the resources at the start of the week. Um, and, um, and it was often because the students didn't have that technical technology available, like, for example, a Chromebook or something, um, some kind of tablet device. Um, so it's great that there's been a government drive in this country to sort of try and help students catch up, because I think particularly where students were disengaged from that learning, um, they've been very disadvantaged, where in, in the schools like mine, for example, we've been relatively lucky. Um, I've seen a, a large surge of activity on, on my platform, so about 3 million page views a day um, during the, the kind of height of the lockdown um, and sort of trying to adapt the technology to help other schools. But I, I think where many schools have been trying to catch up, but I, I think there's still a lot of catching up to do because I think schools can really take advantage of the benefits that, that, that technology brings. Thank you, Jamie. And, and I think you touched, uh, you mentioned about the the increase in your platform as well and, and, and as using all these different other features. I guess my question now, which I'll, I'll, um, I'll direct towards Shira, now that we are moving back to face-to-face -face teaching in the classroom, is technology still needed in mass education or what Jamie mentioned is just a phase that we're aware of as we come out of the pandemic. Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, Desmos, both the tools in the classroom um, were actually designed to be used in the classroom face to face. Um, one of the things that we think can be really powerful about technology is the way that it allows us to collaborate and communicate better. And so, for example, Desmos believes that if it's possible to have two students for every one device. So being able to use technology for all the powerful things that Jamie mentioned and also for ability to see feedback and for all these other things, but also the ability to communicate in person and the ability to collaborate with other people and be in that same space. Um, and so, yes, it is true that Desmos usage grew enormously both in the tools and the classroom over the pandemic, but we are hopeful that that will continue as teachers find ways to use technology in their classrooms to sort of hold its benefits. I think like at Desmos, we believe that technology can both be helpful um, and it can also be harmful. And so as teachers have gotten 
more experience with like, okay, these are the ways in which it actually really supported my teaching the way that Jamie said, like I can now annotate. There's all these things that are, that are really wonderful about it that will also be able to be like a little critical of it um, and make sure that we're using it in ways that support the like collaboration communication that we know supports student learning. And I guess some, some, of the, some of the features you mentioned there, if we found them more effective, maybe we can bring them in the classroom, like you said, and you're creating a platform. <clears throat> like you said, Desmos, you created the platforms, not just for remote learning, but within the classroom. So it, it maybe that, that pushed us to actually learn and, and adapt. And so keeping the best of both worlds would, would maybe be the best moving forward. Yeah. I think that's right. Um, the only thing I was going to say is that the experience in the US is very similar to the experience in the UK that Jamie mentioned, that there was like a okay. really huge disparity in, in what technology was available to teachers and students. And I expect that that will continue. So teachers will continue to be creative and resilient in finding ways to use technology as it comes back into the classroom. Thank you, Shira. Um, I'll pass on to, to, to Berwin. And because we, we've talked about here the technology, we talked about the different platforms adapting. What training have teachers had and what training do they still need, do you think? And do we offer any kind of training um, for webinars for, for, for teachers to, to improve their skills with all this yeah. training? So in terms of using the platforms, there's a lot of training kind of needed for that. I think you know, first and foremost, you want to design services that are intuitive, but you know what's intuitive to one person might not be intuitive to someone else. So you know, training is kind of an important part of it. Um, I think what we've learned having you know, run active learn now for about 10 years is that you know, we've learned a lot about what kind of training works and what doesn't work. So when we first launched active learn, um, we had a lot of kind of training up front. So these big kind of product demonstrations um, and they didn't really work for kind of two reasons. So uh, one was there's a lot to take in at the start. Um, you need kind of more bite sized stuff. And then the second thing is you don't really know what you don't know at the start. So you need to kind of get into the system, start using it before you know what you want to find out, essentially. Um, so what we kind of learned is there were two kind of ways that we could train effectively. So one was really kind of small bite-sized videos. So, you know, two minute videos, and they're really kind of showing you how to do things as and when you need them. So if you want to register students on the platform, there's a two minute video for it. If you want to set tasks, there's a two minute video for it. And then when we do offer kind of more uh, in-depth training, it's after they've been using stuff for like four to six weeks. So they've, you know, they're in the system, they've been using it, and they usually come to us then with lots of questions and really kind of prepared for that training. Um, I think kind of looking forward, like, you know, the future now, what we'd really like to do is embed that training more in the platform itself. So as and when you're kind of using the tools, you get that support popping up and, and guiding you through it. So, you know, there's lots of examples of that already uh, in other areas. And I think, you know, that's the kind of ideal, really. <clears throat> thank, thank you, uh, Berwin. Um, <clears throat> now, remote, this, uh, to quote this, um, remote learning is more effective when pupils have the chance to collaborate with their peers. This is according to some research from the UK's Education Endorsement Foundation. Um, asking directly Mr. Shira here, have you witnessed any evidence of this interaction on your platform? And if so, could you give us some examples with, of it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, two words that we throw around a lot are social and creative, um, that we think that math classrooms should be both social and creative, which means that you're learning together about some, whatever it is and that you're getting to share your ideas and hearing ideas that are different from other folks. Um, as I mentioned before, we suggest two to one devices for when we're in person, which is really challenging if everyone is sitting in their own bedroom. Um, so what we've seen lots of folks do is use breakout rooms for that purpose. So making either pair-sized breakout rooms or, or groups of four and having one student share their screen and other students come in with the idea. Um, there are also a couple of features that I'll show later of the platform where one of the features of the Desmos classroom is that it shows you what other students said. So if you have a response, it'll say, here are what three other students who are thinking about this problem said, and, and we encourage students to read those and either revise their thinking or see how other people's strategies were similar or different from their own. So I think the platform we built is sort of designed with that in mind. Um, and we've seen teachers do some really fantastic and creative things in the time of the pandemic to find ways to make their virtual classrooms um, both more social and more creative. 
Because I guess just just by thinking about what you just said there, uh, I'm, I'm reflecting on my own teaching practice here. You, I always have a few students quiet and silent in the background that, you know, unless I either go up to them or I direct a question to them, they won't share that because they lack confidence. And I'm guessing what you just said, that feature you have will, will encourage them or gives them that, that kind of interaction with other peers when they lack confidence. Yeah. I think that's absolutely right. I think one thing that technology is really wonderful at that I, I know lots of the folks that I'm close with who are in the classroom have shared is that it allows students who want to express their thinking in lots of different ways to express it that way. They can sketch their thinking, they can write their thinking, they can say their thinking out loud to a partner. And, and um, one thing that technology allows us to do is just is to see all this thinking that was expressed in all these different ways. Um, and so it gives students who might feel less comfortable expressing their thinking in words or expressing their thinking out loud to the whole class, they can say, oh, but you like made this really cool sketch. Like, look at the way you were thinking about it. And the teacher can highlight that or the or other students can see that thinking. Thank you. Thank you, Cher. Um, and I, I guess that kind of, you know, with, with that interaction and receiving that feedback, we start being a bit, we have to we tend to become more flexible in our teaching as well. Um, so if I, had, if I pass this to Jamie and in what ways have you, has your digital platform evolved to allow flexible teaching and learning? Um, and I don't know if you want to talk a bit more about that flexibility as well and, and maybe share something from your own platform. Uh, sorry, you're muted again, yeah, Jamie. I'll do it again. I just only noticed. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, so um, they've brought, I'll share my screen in a second just to show um, mainly the virtual whiteboards. But um, I think what people like about DOSFOS Maths is that there's such a variety in sort of how you can support students. So. Um, I have two sources of questions. I've got like a massive bank of about uh, 50,000 exam questions, um, a particularly large amount of Pearson questions, I, I add. Um, and uh, those can be used in a variety of different ways. So teachers can either put them together in terms of like a collection of questions, which they can then set online to students. It marks it for them uh, and provide the instant feedback to student. Um, there's also kind of uh, educational videos. Um, there's a kind of uh, sort of online game that students can play against each other in the classroom environment. Um, there's a virtual whiteboard where those exam questions can be shared via a kind of connected whiteboard. And that's the thing I'm going to show you in a second. Um, and you've also got these kind of second source of questions where I've got about these uh, 800 question generators using a lot of Desmos technology, in fact. Um, so we, we've loved the uh, Desmos API and those generate kind of randomly random questions on quite granular question types um, so that students can have repetitive practice before they're more confident in approaching the kind of broader range of exam questions. So if I just quickly share my screen um, and hopefully this works. Um, oh, so um, now the, hopefully you can see my screen can you yep see we can see yeah we can see um, this is just my own dashboard i've anonymized the data so everything's scrambled um but if for example uh you go to resources uh, the live classroom game is a sort of uh, game you can play against each other i'm not going to demonstrate that now if i go to the virtual whiteboard um and i can actually share the link so you can select a class that you've set up and then it will pre-populate the list of connected whiteboards with people in your class but i'm not going to do that um, I'm just going to set classroom mode without selecting a class and then I'll be given a link and then I can share a question. In fact, I'm going to put this, this in the chat. So if I just share that link, uh, I'm trying to actually find it. Um, wait, where's the chat? Uh, the chat, sorry. There we go. So hopefully everyone can see this link. Uh, and if you click that, I should then be able to see the people as they're connected to my whiteboard. So yeah, yeah, we've got some people. Um, now, just to demonstrate with a non-mathematical thing, if I just draw a start of a picture of a cat, um, I can hopefully see people as they uh, finish their cat with their lovely drawings. Um, there we go. These are all the people. And then, oh, yeah, we've got some ears from Melios. That's, uh, that's a lovely cat. I, I have to say, I want to say, wow. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Julie, that's a, that's a pretty good cat. Um, and I can actually interact with individual students if I go to Julie. Uh, and, and I say, great. Um, and you can see the variety of tools. There's also, um, you can actually write um, mathematical text. So, oh, look, we're getting some thanks. But if I use this, for example, I can type uh, math text. So you can see this algebraic keyboard that comes up. Um, but what the most powerful thing is, if I go back to the master whiteboard, uh, I'm gonna, sorry, I'm gonna nuke all your cats, apologies but I can select questions from a database of questions. So if I want say, I don't know, filter by topic, um, I can select just an Excel paper, I want to, but I'm gonna go to Shapespace, go to Pythagoras, um, and this is using the exam bank of questions rather than the key skills platform I mentioned. Let's go to 2D Pythagoras. 
uh, we'll filter to Edexcel. So uh, Edexcel, uh, let's go for a higher tier question. Um, filter, and then uh, let's just select anyone. That's quite hard. Let's make it easier. Um, and then that's, uh, yeah, there we go. So if I use that, then hopefully you should all see on your screens uh, this particular Edexcel exam question. Uh, I, as a teacher, can annotate over it. Um, so if I'm saying that's your C, that's your A, that's your B, etc. And you should all see my annotation, but I can go to the I and see all your annotations. Yeah, I can see Julie starting to work it out, etc. So that's just one tiny part of the site in terms of function functionality available. And these two sources of questions, your kind of exam bank and the kind of key skills questions, um, they kind of underpin the entirety of the site in terms of the different functionality available. Um, but yes, you can obviously set work to students. Uh, they get instant feedback. There's sort of educational videos to support them. Um, and um, teachers find that super effective and thousands of schools are using it, which is great. Uh, and increasingly around the world as well. Thank you. Jamie, Jamie can I just ask, because um, some people have discussed about the digital whiteboards before and said, have you found, do you, do you, do you think we need touchscreen devices to write? Or have you found that even with the mouse and the touchpad, students are able to give good answers on this? Have you, have you got any feedback on that? Um, it depends on mouse skills. Everyone always admires the, the extent that I can draw quite nicely on a screen with my mouse. Um, really? Trackpad. Um, I, I think personally, the whiteboard is most effective when students are using a touch device. Um, mm -hmm. But to be honest, um, many students are proficient with using a mouse um, and, and can draw stuff. Uh, I'm not quite sure how else you do it other than using mouse or drawing, but um, I think both methods are effective. Okay, good. Any, just a question about um, what, are they able to use this um, on their phones as well, or is it more for laptops? Um, no, yeah, very much. It, it, it's optimized for use on phones as well and sort of trying to increasingly improve the technology there. So, yeah, it, it works. The whole platform for students, um, whether it's answering questions for homework or the whiteboard uh, or the live game I mentioned, um, that all works on a phone. Uh, and okay. eventually there will be a, a natural proper phone app. Um, but at the moment, it's a sort of like mobile friendly website. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much, Jamie. Thanks for sharing that. For, for, uh, I've been fascinated with that feature there. Um, Moving to Berwin, I just have a question here. Many teachers, and I think I've addressed this before, but I'd like to bring that back. Um, many teachers are keen to return to normality and what they were used to prior to the pandemic. How do we encourage teachers to choose the right technology and embed it in their daily routines? I mean, what, what features does an online platform have that could support and improve the teaching and learning moving forward? Yeah, I think in terms of you know, making the decisions about what to use, um, you know, evidence is really important there. So whether that's you know talking to other teachers or case studies, but also kind of you know data about how effective something is. Um, so you know one of the things I mentioned earlier, the national tutoring program is something we were involved in uh, last year and continue to be this year. Um, so you know that's a great opportunity for us to learn about how to effectively deliver tutoring in the classroom and use it as a kind of support for teachers. So since December last year, I think we've delivered almost 40,000 hours of tuition now. So it's a really kind of big amount of tuition in a short space of time. Um, and we have kind of baseline assessments at the start and summative assessments at the end of each 15 hour block of tuition. So we're just now starting to see the data come back on that. And, and you know, there's a huge amount we can learn from that about you know, what makes effective tuition and how can we fit it alongside what teachers are doing in the classroom? Because, you know, the, the aim of the National Tutoring Programme is that it really is there to kind of support teachers. So all our tutors have a conversation with teachers about, you know, what they're learning, specific needs of the students um, and how they want to approach it. And we're seeing really good results from that. So, um, yeah, we're seeing kind of attainment in those tests almost doubling from the start to finish. And also the NFERs, so the National um, Foundation for Educational Research, are doing a wider kind of study across all the providers. So I think having that data will really help kind of, you know, teachers decide what's effective and, and see how to use it in their, in their classroom. So that's something we're really kind of excited about. And you know, going forward, thinking about you know, how we kind of embed that into our other services. So how does that support Active Learn, Active Hub, uh, and other services that we have, um, and how we can use it to help teachers. So that's just one kind of example, I guess. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I don't know if Shira, do you have anything to add on this on this point here? 
I think it's mostly that one of the things that we really love about technology is that like the insights that it gives us into what students know. Um, and so what they're, and, to, and not just what they know, but also what they're thinking, right? There's something really wonderful about Jamie's whiteboard where like, it's not just that I can see their answer. I can also see like everything that they were thinking along the way. Um, and yeah. so I thought I might, if you would allow me to just like highlight one Desmos classroom activity. Of course. Um, I can do. Awesome. So I'm going to share my screen. Let's make okay. sure that I get the right one. All right. So this is one of my favorite activities. It's called Point Collector. Um, it's from Desmos Classroom. And actually, I pulled it from a collection made by MEI, um, which I know is based in the UK. And this is a whole variety of activities that are aligned with GCSE mathematics. So there's 18 activities in here. And I know that uh, Pearson is also working behind the scenes to make something right now. It's still in the works, um, but look out for something coming real soon. And so Point Collector is all about inequalities. And I, this morning, ran an activity with my students. In this case, my students were uh, a variety of folks who work at Desmos. And what's really fun is I get to see their thinking. And, and you'll notice that I don't actually work with Gauss, even though I would love to work with Gauss. Um, but they, their names for, so that students can feel more comfortable with their, their work being shown. Um, for right now, I put on anonymized mode so that they can know that their thinking is safe. And, and I can see kind of a big overview of, okay, if I want to assess them for learning, I know where my students are at generally with these big ideas, where things are going well. Um, my favorite is actually the dot. So the dot means I want to know more. So I can actually click into screen four and see like, what were students thinking on screen four? And say, okay, um, this was a settle a dispute. It's like one thing that we love about technology here is it allows students to not just share their answers, but also share their reasoning. And I can see that actually all of my students agree. All of my students think that Mara will earn the highest score in Point Collector. But there's all these really interesting different ways that students are explaining it. And I'll zoom in just a little bit. Um, and one thing that I can do is I can highlight, I can take a little snapshot of a couple things. I see Felix has got a lot of words there. I see a sort of a shortened version. And I can go up to this snapshots area, which allows me to sort of pick out and say, what do you notice? What do you wonder? And then present that to students so that not only am I seeing what students know and what students are thinking, but I can share that with, with the whole class and ask the class, like, what do you notice about what these students are thinking and what's happening exactly at that moment? Um, and I talked about, and this is sort of the social element. And then I also wanted to just take a minute to show you some of the creative element because there's some really cool stuff in here. So it to interrupt you there for a second. <laughs> please. If you go back to that to that screen where you were, because I was just thinking, when as as a head of department, a lot of the times we discuss on how to um, cut down on teacher workload and how to give constructive feedback, and I'm just seeing a great example here where you are finding you can easily identify a few students who have similar. Mis I'm, I'm thinking of my outside the box here, uh, similar misconceptions or issues or mistakes, and you can write the comments straight away and address a few students at once that have similar misconceptions, if that makes sense, or similar mistakes. Um, yeah. And I can see I can see how that could be effective in speed time and also um, support the teachers in that aspect with the workload. Yeah, absolutely. So this, like one thing that I love about what you just mentioned is that, so the, the thing that I'm showing right now is something that I might project for the whole class, right? And so this allows me to say like, look how wonderful, like, like look at all the things that we can learn from something mm -hmm. that's incorrect, right? So I'm not just giving feedback to that student saying like the thing that you did wasn't right. I'm saying like, look how awesome of a conversation we can have when we look at two different ways of saying the same thing, or when we look at an incorrect and a correct way of saying the same thing. Look how powerful we are in our thinking in its process and not just in its final answer and not just in the fact that you sort of have all of those check marks along the side. Um, we do, yeah, so that, that's kind of like one of the things that is wonderful about being able to see that like, wow, look at all these students' different ways of solving the same problem. Like yeah, all this different, different methods here. as well. You can, yeah, different answers, different methods, I guess, as well. I'm sharing that. 
because a lot of the time students just think there's one answer one way and, and i guess this way you're showcasing the different the variety of methods uh, as well because they're all recorded exactly um and it's recorded for for, for me to see to see sort of where do i want to where do i want to check in with that student and give them some individual feedback and say like hey have you tried this um, if i go to the actual screen i can see the kinds of feedback that students will get on their own so I'm just going to pop in here. I'm going to I'll stop screen sharing in a second, but I can look at the student view of the screen. And depending on how I change the inequality, like right now my score is not so hot because I have like mostly these blue these red points which give me negative points, but I can change to 10 and get interpretive feedback to say not just like am I right or am I wrong but hey like this is the area that I covered I, I covered this purple area and like uh oh I haven't covered any of the points now um, is that the best that I can do um, and then I can try more things and see like oh oh gosh that's worse um, now I cover the entire area and so on and so forth and so I think this is sort of the the classroom side of what does most can do and I'll just take 15 seconds to highlight there's some exciting fun stuff happening from Pearson that they're building activities. I won't show any more other than to say that that's coming. Um, and yeah, I feel really grateful for all the cool ways that, that teachers have, have taken this platform and seen some really amazing, brilliant things that their students do. Thank you, Shira. Um, and I think I think if I want to bring out something that you showed us there is the it's a great tool for assessment for learning. Um, and we do know that in, in maths education, assessment for learning is an imperative part of the teaching and learning cycle, um, because that's what informs the teachers of the progress students make, highlights potential misconceptions, as I mentioned as well, and, and gaps. Um, but something that came from the Department of Education throughout the lockdown is that, and this is again quoting this, uh, effective assessment and feedback is one of the biggest challenges that teachers have found during remote learning. Um, and I think you just shared with us one innovative, you know, way um, that you've seen teachers, your platform allows that, but also teachers uh, deploying using their, your, your, your platform to, to address that. Um, so if I pass to, to Jamie as well, if you could let us know how did the public respond to the other interactive features you you've, you've have and any other features that support, support all this. Uh, yeah, sorry, if I just share my screen again, um, then I'll be able to, in terms of the kind of assessment for learning sort of feedback kind of thing. Uh, hopefully you can see my screen again with some smiley kids on uh, Chromebooks and one trying to pretend they have an apple. Um, but um, if I go to my account, I hope they still anonymize this, um, and go to view assigned work, um, I can see a particular uh, task they've done. So this is because um, I was at Wimbledon on Tuesday, skiving from school. Uh, and uh, so this was the cover work that I set them. Um, and you can see um, the kind of, this is a particular task, I can't remember how many, eight questions. So I think this is one of the topic tests that we've compiled. Um, and I can instantly uh, see a, a, an incorrect answer that someone's put. Uh, I can see what the correct answer was, their answer, uh, and then the actual DLXL mark scheme in this case. And I can feedback to that student. So I could type in here, and actually there's an option to actually give the same feedback for everyone who got that question wrong. Um, there's all sorts of data analytics tools as well. So if, for example, I want to um, see the breakdown by topic. Now, I think for this particular one, it's not going to be exciting because it's all on the quadratic formula. So, oh, actually, there is, there is a bit of variety. So it's kind of automatically worked out all the skills involved in this particular collection of questions. So I can see that they're slightly weak on the surface area of a cylinder. Um, and then this was the bulk of it, the 166 questions on the quadratic formula, um, because that's what the task was on. Uh, so they still need a bit of work with that. Um, but apparently they're good at quadratic equations by factorization. And there's also a, a tool to sort of see uh, what the worst questions were, the kind of common wrong answers, et cetera. Um, so that's just another, another tool there. Um, but it's, um, it's just great how a school's been using it. The, the, the big new system, if I can mention it, is the kind of courses system. So um, there's all this different functionality around the site. And I think sometimes students didn't realize, okay, I just want to sequentially work through some topics. Uh, how can I do that? Um, so um, now schools and publishers, including Pearson, can develop um, their own courses. So if I go to exam boards and publishers um, and show you what the Pearson one looks like, so I go to Pearson um, and only oh, at Excel actually. Um, so I've got, for example, their height. So some of these, of course, are not public because I can see them as an admin. But if I go to GCC Foundation, um, 
I can then see this course that's been set up and I can sequentially as a, a student work through these topics. So if I want to go to integers and place value, I can click that and here's a particular unit with uh, the stuff from your scheme of work. Um, and then these are the, one, the ones that are not um, grayed out are the ones where I've made videos. So I can watch a video on ordering decimals and that's me teaching how to order decimals and uh, it remembers where they are. And then they, the students can practice. So this is their progress, well, this is my progress as me practicing as a student uh, on these different topics. Um, and if I wanna do that ordering uh, say decimals, uh, let's practice that. Um, and then it would bring up this collection of questions. So they get stuck, they can watch the, the worked example video and then they order it. Um, it's gonna be a warning that I'm wrong. Um, but if I just give in any old answer, um, it then uh, this one doesn't really have any explanation, but a lot of the questions uh, on here uh, do have really detailed feedback about how to do it. And if they get stuck, uh, they can watch the worked example. There's also, again, this whiteboard. In fact, teachers, they set a task. They can actually require working. So they can then view that working, that data analytics software I was showing you earlier. Um, so yeah, the course system is great and schools have been using this to develop their own courses. So um, this is uh, my school, for example, and we've set it up for the entirety of our schemes of work. Um, and it's just combining that key, skill, like my resources, so the stuff they can download, the slides of the classroom, practicing those key skills generators, um, and they can get like an example random question um, or um, practice it. Um, for teachers, they can quickly set work from that. So create a worksheet. You've got the kind of exam practice as well, and they can do the topic test, which uh, is what I set as my cover work that I showed you earlier. Um, so I'm really excited about this new platform. It was only this, this, this particular aspect of it was only released a few weeks ago. Uh, and there's already like over a thousand courses that schools have been generating um, in preparation for the next academic year. Uh, right, I'll be quiet now. So uh, give other people some time. Um, but thank you for that. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, very useful stuff, all of them. Thanks. Um, if I pass on to, to Berwin as well, um, what, in thinking about your platform, uh, you mentioned Active Learner and Active App. What, what have we learned during the pandemic? Um, and what have we changed because of that? Any, any reflections on this? Yeah, I think um, the way in which we deliver content is much more varied now. So um, you know, I've already talked about the National tutoring program, which is kind of all online you know, delivery of tuition. And now we're developing Active Hub as a kind of evolution of Active Learn. And we're really thinking hard about, okay, how do teachers and students want the content delivered going forward? So, you know, at the moment we're developing content to be used in two kind of different scenarios. So one is live, so in the classroom, or if you're using video conferencing, then also kind of asynchronous content or independent content. And that's becoming kind of more important. And that independent content has to be really supportive. So, you know, lots of videos, explanations, um, interactive questions that have has really good, like specific feedback. Um, and there's so many kind of, you know, user cases for that content. So, you know, self-isolation bubbles, things like that, but also, you know, catch up, flip learning, revision. You know, there's loads of ways in which you could use that content. And I think that's something that you know we didn't necessarily have before. We had we had kind of in-class content and we had homework, but we didn't have that kind of fully supportive independent learning mode. So I think that's something that's definitely kind of uh, a new focus for us coming out of the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Berwin. Um, we do have um, two questions and the Q&A that um, I'd like to, to see if we can answer. Um, I'll just put, pull them up. Uh, the first one's for, if, if I think, based on what we just spoke about, uh, maybe Jamie and Shira, um, this might be uh, for, for you to answer. It says um, students use phones in class this year and had the option to use them for remote lessons. Um, does the panel have any practical suggestions for discouraging students from becoming distracted while on the phones? Uh, would either one of you like to comment on this? Um, just one thing to say is that there is actually software um, out there to prevent students from being off task. So we, we use a commercial platform called uh, Go Guardian at my school, and it allows teachers to monitor what the students are doing. We can restrict what tab they're on because um, they, they use their Chromebooks. We have a bit more control. It's slightly more difficult if they've got their phones because it's quite then you would have to actually walk around the classroom and see what they're doing. Um, mm -hmm. But if students have school controlled devices, then there's lots of control over that. Thank you. Um, 
Is, is there anything else from any of the panelists on this one here? Okay, thank you. Um, the, uh, the the second one here, um, maybe Berwin, you can let me say anything on this one. It says, is there any research evidence that supports the claim that EdTech supports collaborative, collaborative learning? Um, and, and, and then this person said that they're doing a dissertation um, and found out that most teachers believe that collaborative is one of the problems during the remote teaching. How do you see this? Yeah, so, so I don't know off the top of my head, I can't name any uh, papers or anything like that, but I know when um, when we were preparing the kind of national teaching programme, so part of that um, programme is around kind of small group tutoring, so you know it's, it's capped at three students, um, but they do, there's a big kind of push towards having group, wow. uh, small group tutoring, and part of that was because of the collaboration between students in those sessions, and I know there was evidence that the EF uh, had around that, that was part of the kind of wider national teaching program. So I could dig them out and I, I could find who wanted that and send it on. Um, but I don't know off the top of my head, you know, where it came from or the, or the name of the papers or anything. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Barry. Um just to just before we conclude, I'd like to and I'd like to address this question to, to all the panelists. Um how do we move forward? Um, what are the next steps in digital mass education? Um, so, so thinking about where we where we've come from, and then what what is this? Could you summarize this maybe in one sentence? How do we move forward? And if I start with with um, Shira first, yeah, uh, it's hard to summarize in a sentence, but I'll do my best. <laughs> I think just thinking about like what is the power technology can give us? Like how can it help us let students see their own ideas and other folks's to create conversation and delight? Um, and I think the way that we move forward at Desmos is by listening to teachers and students. Um, so how do we listen to teachers and students for the ways, the things that they need in order to foster collaboration, to feel comfortable sharing their ideas, to feel like they're learning from other folks and going forward there. Thank you, thank you, Shira. Um, if I pass on to Jamie. Yeah, I, I think it's being making the pedagogy central. So when we think about the successful strategies for teaching in terms of our pedagogy, how can we sort of take those and then sort of apply that to technology? Because there's, I think, a lot of gimmicky ed tech to technology out there. There's also a lot of very good stuff. And I think the good stuff is those that really think about how students learn and, and how technology can, can kind of utilize that in, in the best way. Thank you for that. Uh, and Bear Windlast? Yeah, I'm going to say two things, but I'll make it quick. So I think one is, you know, there's a lot of data now uh, with education. So it's how can you get really clear, actionable uh, information from that data? I think that's really important and a big challenge for us. I think the other thing is, um, you know, recognising that teachers use lots of different things um, and we need to kind of allow for that flexibility. And I think, you know, with Jamie and with um, Desmos as well, you know, we are showing examples where we do collaborate and work together. And I think that is really important that you know, we recognize that and, and facilitate that to a certain extent as well. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, at this point, we're coming to a, to a closure here. So thank you everyone. I don't know if anyone wants to add any more comments uh, before we conclude uh, if, from anyone from the panel list here. Well, Thank you everyone for joining us for this session on digital maths education as part of the PSM Maths Festival. We hope you found it interesting, helpful and starting a starting point to further discussion. We look forward to seeing you at the other sessions over the course of the festival. You will see a feedback survey open in your browser when we end the webinar. If you could take just a couple of minutes to complete this, uh, we would greatly appreciate this. And finally, we just wanted to remind you again to join the conversation on social media and beyond using the hashtag PSNMathFest21 and by entering our mini competitions, nominating your colleagues as math champions and by answering our polls that you'll see on at PSN schools. Please do get involved. Um, There'll be further information on the website as well, so please uh, keep an eye on them. And thank you again for joining us for today. Take care.